Uh, my name is Alan Sessoms. Uh, my date of birth is uh, November 17, 1946, and I grew, I grew up, I was born in the South Bronx, and I grew up there in New York City. Would you tell us about your uh, childhood and your family? Uh, where were they before New York? Maybe a little history? The history is even interesting to me now. Uh, my parents were both from the Carolinas, my father from North Carolina, my mother from South Carolina, and they left the South um, because they couldn't stand it. And they met in New York City um, and were married uh, four days before my father was drafted into the military. <laughs> and he spent five years in the Navy in the Pacific, uh, almost being killed a number of times, being court-martialed a few times because he didn't, the segregation was driving him crazy in the the attitude of some of the officers were not exactly positive. So we, but he s managed to get through that. And when he came back, apparently her mother got pregnant in three days. <laughs> uh, she was a nurse uh, practicing in a, a hospital that's, that's infamous now. It was uh, the, the centerpiece of a movie by George C. Scott called Hospital, which characterized it accurately, more or less, is probably the worst hospital mm -hmm. in America, <laughs> actually. It was extraordinary. Yeah, I, I have a copy of it. Um, and my mother was really an extraordinary person, and she f was a nurse in that place for 30 years. Okay. When, my f when I was born, my brother and I have a twin brother, and when uh, I was born, after my brother, because he came out 59 minutes before me, uh, I got the birth certificate. My father wasn't employed. He was an unemployed presser. That's what's on the birth certificate. And I didn't have a first name on the birth certificate. They wrote it in later. Because they didn't, they were, my mother was told insistently by the doctors that there was only one child. There was no twin. And she knew better because she was a nurse. And she couldn't convince them. So we said, OK. They said, let's have one name just in case. <laughs> and I got the second name. But they had to think about it, which was good. So my brother's a junior, and I'm whatever's left. And I prefer it that way. And uh, your so father from North Carolina, mother from South Carolina. Yes. And uh, they, so their families go back to those two states. Yes. Um, there's a, some Native American on my mother's side. In fact, my grandmother really looked Native American. Mm. But uh, we go back, my family goes back eight generations. Mm. And they were able to track it. It's, Interesting. You came over mostly from Nigeria, and there's a mix of all sorts of other stuff in there, but predominantly Nigerian. And they came to those two Carolinas. Yeah, they, they're well. No, they were. They didn't go to the Carolinas. No, I mean they were. That's where. Well, the, my last name Sesums, mm -hmm. is um, named after the owners, the slave owners, uh, of my great 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 grandparents. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, his name was uh, Sessions, mm. and everybody got stuck with that name. But then they sp spelled it differ differently, and it was Sessoms, S-E-S-S-O-M-S. And what's interesting is everybody with that last name is a relative somehow. And I don't know hardly any of them, but everybody with that, that last name is a relative. So your parents uh, lived in New York City? They moved, they, they moved up to New York City. They met in Harlem. Uh, he courted her, and then they got married, mm -hmm. and then he got stuck in the Navy for five years. Uh, and we were born in this hospital, Lincoln Hospital. Yes. My mother's a nurse there, yes. which is really quite interesting. And one of the things that she never let us do, even if we were really deathly ill, is spend the night in that place. Mm -hmm. She said, it's better for you to die at home than to be absolutely murdered in this <laughs> place. So we, uh, we did OK. My, my, my parents were really strong people. Um, my father pretended to be a tyrant. He became an entrepreneur and, and did pretty well. Um, but he was a soft touch. I mean, he really was just a, a soft touch. And my uh, mother was just an angel. Um, who was a, she didn't even pretend to be tough. She was just a soft touch all around. But the family was very structured. So it was clear that what we were going to do was be educated, period. And what was interesting is that we grew up in a a tenement building in the South Bronx, which was rent controlled. And my father 
had this apartment. I guess he found it when my mother got pregnant, so they moved into this apartment in the South Bronx. And we grew up there. And it was an interesting apartment building because several of my mother's relatives also lived in the building. I don't know how that happened. And so there was never a problem with babysitting. Her older sister was there, my Aunt Florence, who lived until she was 105, uh, and other relatives, uncles and cousins. And it was a really interesting kind of environment where everybody looked after everywhere else. And it was, it was the kind of thing that kids hate when they're growing up, because you can't get away with anything. Because we went to school, we walked to school, elementary school, and uh, what is now middle school, and you couldn't do anything that was kind of offensive to the teachers because the entire neighborhood would know about it before you got home. <laughs> so you couldn't, you couldn't say anything to your parents because they knew it. So it was really kind of curtains. That was a, an interesting discipline. It didn't mean that we couldn't do anything. It meant that if we did, we'd get caught. Yeah. So we had to realize that there were consequences. But our parents were really kind of gentle about it uh, to a certain extent. My father was a little tough. But we got away with murder. It was really a very warm mm. and cohesive childhood. Mm. The community was very the supportive. It was, it, was a, it was an interesting community. When I, the early times, early years, when I was probably up to the age of 10 or 11, it was Jewish neighborhood. Mm. And I was this crazy kid who made rockets and launched rockets from the street. And I had a pet rabbit, a gigantic white rabbit. And I would walk this rabbit on a leash, walking around the Bronx. And people thought it was strange, but nobody messed with me or the rabbit. <laughs> it was really pretty hysterical. And we would walk every Saturday to the Jewish market, which was uh, a half an hour walk or so, and near the Grand Concourse. We, lived, we could walk to the Grand Concourse pretty easily. And we would show up with this rabbit, and was, all of a sudden these guys really understood that there was this crazy kid with this white rabbit, and they would save carrot tops for the whole week, and we would go, and they would give us these gigantic bags of carrot tops for the rabbit to eat. It was just very funny. That, it was a, sort of a, the kind of neighborhood it was. Um, but it was a tough neighborhood. But nobody messed with the kids. Uh, mm. it, it went from Jewish to Cuban to Dominican mm. to Puerto Rican, but nobody ever messed with the kids, unless the kids screw up. This in it's in it's in the South Bronx at Fort Apache, what uh, Prospect Avenue, Union Avenue. Okay. Uh, Paul Newman made a movie called Fort Apache, the Bronx. Mm. The opening scene was around the corner from my house, mm. where there was a police car full of bullet holes and the arm leaning out. That was around the corner. They shot it from <laughs> around the corner from my house. So it was a, it was somewhat of a it was an all black neighborhood. It was it was never an all black never neighborhood. Black. Yeah. But, but predominantly blacks and Jews? It was predominantly Jews. Predominantly Jews. Okay. And then it transitioned to I other, other mm -hmm. ethnicities, but it was, it, it was always a mixture, and it was never predominantly anything, mm -hmm. until basically we went to high school, mm -hmm. and then we, the neighborhood became a little more um, rowdy, I would think it would say. There was, there was a heroin epidemic, mm -hmm. and there would be people who would just not mm -hmm. do well in that context. And there were all sorts of drug addicts on the street and so on. But the, nobody ever bothered the kids. Except that the, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, was found in the trunk of a car with bullet holes in his head. He was 15. And that is emblematic of the fact that you'd, if you messed around, you got into trouble. Because he was messing around with this, these mm -hmm kind of drug dealers, but it never happened to anybody else. Larry Buford was his name, it's kind of extraordinary. We were wondering what happened to Larry, because he was going to school with us, and all of a sudden he wasn't there. And the police came around, and the car was, car was literally parked in front of his parents' apartment building. Yes. But they left the kids alone, the younger kids. Because they, well, all the kids, because the par they knew the parents would kill them, actually, <laughs> if, if anybody messed with the kids. And and so it was, there was, it was not an unwritten code. Everybody knew it. But it was, a, it was a pretty tough neighborhood. For example, we learned how to manage the police. If there was an accident or somebody got shot, you waited until the body was cold.
before you called the police because it was highly likely the police were involved. Mm -hmm. There was enormous corruption in the police department in New York, which helped in some strange way for the neighborhood to be cohesive around protecting itself. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter what ethnicity you were, everybody knew it. Yeah. So everybody took care of everybody else. It was really kind of remarkable. My kindergarten teacher was Ms. Euro, and she was this extraordinary white-haired woman, and she is the one I remember most from elementary school, mm -hmm. except for my first grade teacher, who was this incredibly beautiful black woman. Uh, uh, we, her name was Miss Jones, and then she did something crazy, got married, and that was it. Everybody was completely shattered. We never wanted to be there again. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, but when I went to elementary school, I've got the class picture, and you know, there were 30 kids in my class, and three of us were, were black, and there were a couple of Puerto Ricans. The same thing in junior high school then, uh, which was a brand new school. It, it opened up, and we were the first class there, and it was the same kind of demographic. Mm -hmm. uh, and high school was really similar. I went to a high school, Theodore Roosevelt High School. We t I, went to, I went to Bronx Science for a year, and I ran track, and at Bronx Science, it bothered me that I could run backwards and beat most of the people. <laughs> so I decided this was not my place. And I transferred to Roosevelt, because it was easy. It was, you could go to any high school in the city you wanted. And I, I had the good fortune then of the school being across the street from Fordham University mm. at, on the Rose Hill campus, the Bronx campus, the big campus that they have. Rose Hill, I think, is at Lincoln Center. I, can't, I just can't remember the names. And I basically took my senior year at Fordham University, right across the street. And he started a business, a bodega, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Bronx. We could walk from, we, walk, we would have to walk past his door to get to the element, the middle school, mm -hmm. and we would just walk past it. So mm -hmm. that was another thing that everybody <laughs> in the neighborhood knew about. Um, and then he also opened a restaurant across the street from the bodega mm -hmm. um, in the South Bronx, and we got to know some really interesting people. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis Armstrong would, uh, play in some of the clubs around there, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't let the kids in, but we'd get sneak in the back. Yeah. Henry Red Allen was enormous, popular trumpeter, jazz trumpeter, lived in the apartment above my father's store. Mm -hmm. So we got to know him fairly well. It was just an interesting group of people. And the schools were very good. All the schools in the city were extraordinary, actually. There were some terrible schools, but not many terrible schools. Were there racial tensions? No. Not, in, not where we grew up, because everybody was everything, and so it, it, there was no kind of tension between the different uh, ethnicities, because everybody was different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and when I went to high school at Theodore Roosevelt, actually I was one of the few black kids in my class. Uh, what's interesting is that this is a 4,000 kid high school, and 85% of the kids got region scholarships. Uh, you take this exam and the, the region scholarships gave you a bunch of money to go to college. And everybody else did something else. But there was no kind of slack. No one, everybody had the expectation that you were going to do well, period. And if you weren't going to do well, you didn't need to be there, kind of. Um, and it was, I found it to be slightly more rigorous than Bronx Science, uh, just because it had to be, to be good, you know. If, if, if everybody compared everybody else to Stuyvesant and, and the science, and uh, Brooklyn Tech, I guess is the other one. And it was, it was one of these environments that people had fun competing. And then uh, the track team was so much better that it was kind of ridiculous. When, <laughs> when did they discover that you were a scientist? I announced, there was this t television program called the Mary Mailman Show. And it was every Saturday, and they would have these kids come on and sort of talk about what they wanted to be. When I say kids, four years old, okay, five years old. So I went on the show, and I was asked by the host, who was dressed as a mailman, just a jolly white guy with a crazy beard, looking totally stereotypical, shall I say. And he asked me what I wanted to be uh, after he asked my brother. And he asked my brother first. And my brother said, oh, I want to be a policeman or something like that. And the guy said, oh, it's very nice. He said, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a scientist. 
and I just simply declared I had no idea quite what that meant, but it really sounded good. And it was the kind of stuff, you know, okay, we'll be a scientist. It was kind of fun. So that's when I declared it, and it just, I didn't okay. lose it, yeah. And, and uh, how did you end up going on that show? It, that seems, I don't know anything about this TV show. Neither do I. <laughs> I have no idea how I got you it. You don't know how you got to go. I, I was literally four or five years old, I have no idea. Yeah. It was a raise, yes. uh, probably through the, the city. I, mean, I, don't just, I just don't know. They would take kids from different neighborhoods and bring kids of all ethnicities on the show, and you'd rotate. There would be kids every weekend. Yes. And it was a Saturday morning show. And so, uh, so at school, you did very well, and you must have excelled in the sciences. You talked about bank science. No, I, I, I excelled in everything. I mean, it wasn't. I was, a, I, was a, you know, I was a nerd, yeah. and it, it, it was okay. But I also was a jock, oh. so it, it balanced out running track and mm -hmm. being a good student. Mm -hmm. Being a good student was a matter of life or death because if I wasn't a good student, my parents would have <laughs> taken it was me. Out. A very strong yes. Emphasis on, like you mentioned, about education. Yeah, and my brother, my twin brother didn't quite have the same discipline. He went to aviation trades high school because he, he got tracked into the vocational technical track in elementary school, which was kind of crazy because he was a really smart kid. But he was lazy. Mm -hmm. And, and he, my, my parents forced him to find a s structure that would allow him to be disciplined. So he went to aviation trades and he was in the Civil Air Patrol. But take, he took two hours each way to go to school, high school, mm -hmm. from the Bronx to uh, Queens, I guess it was. And that was a long track, but he did it because he liked it. And the discipline was useful for him, but then unfortunately he ended up going to the Air Force and mm -hmm. stayed in for 21 years, but it's kind of odd. But he, he liked that structure. And I have a younger sister also, who was a radical growing up because when she was, uh, I guess in high school, the Black Panthers were really important and everybody was more or less recognizing that dilemma that the African-American, uh, there was no community, the people had. Everybody speaks of an African-American community, there isn't a community, there are a bunch of people who have totally different views, like everybody else, like the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Come on, there's no Jewish community. <laughs> there are 20 people and there's 20 families in the synagogue, that's the community. <laughs> so she was a radical, my father thought that was kind of interesting, but she ends up being going to medical school. She did, she did extremely well in college. Um, I talked to her, she wanted to go, she went to Lehman College in the, in the Bronx. Uh, it was Hunter College uptown, then they switched it to Lehman. Um, it's part of the city university, because the price was right now, it's free, basically. Um, and she then decided she wanted to go to medical school, she wanted to go to Meharry Medical School because it's an African American HBCU as a medical school, and all the doctors were cute. And I was a graduate student at Yale then. I said, you have to be out of your mind. You apply to Yale, and if you get in, you go. Not only did she get in, <laughs> they paid her way, and then she went into Army ROTC in medical school, and she had a surplus every year of $10,000. That, that was real money. They paid for absolutely everything, everything. And then she went into the Army for two years, left as a captain, and started making money. It's really, it's interesting, but it, it was because we're incubated in that space. You can't, you, you can't overestimate the, the structure the parents put in because it was, they came from a place where no matter what you did, you couldn't get ahead, which is why they left. And they said, the only thing people can't take away from you is your education. You can make a lot of money, they can take the money away. I mean, that's what the, the IRS does. You, you could be gorgeous, but you're gonna get old. You know, it's just the way it is, but if you're educated, so you, uh, then you eventually applied for college, and uh, what do you do? I, yeah, I had a, 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 not a guidance counselor, but a teacher in high school who was, you know, pretty serious, but he had graduated from a place called Union College in Schenectady, New York. I never heard of it, ever. Um, Apparently, it, is, it was, at that time, and remains, a very high-quality liberal arts college with a very strong focus on science and engineering. And it has a big endowment, and um, 
that was interesting. So I, I, he said, you got to apply. Mm -hmm. So I applied to Union, and I applied to the University of Michigan. And Michigan gave me a chalk scholarship. And I said, well, what happens if I get hurt? <laughs> and Union didn't give me any track scholarship. It was Division three. They gave me tuition and fees, room and board, and allowed me to, to run track on the team and on the US national team. So I had you know, the best of all possible worlds. And Union was, was a great experience, which is fabulous. But there were four blacks in my incoming class. And there was one other African-American that I met in the school, and that was it. And we were at 1800, it was all male then, 1800 kids. And I had a wonderful time, because I was used to that kind of environment. It, I, I never, nobody ever noticed when I was growing up whether you were black or not. Because, I mean, it was probably a little worse being a Jew, right? So, so everybody got that, and they spent their time understanding um, each other and learning how to understand each other. So when I got to Union, I was this smart black kid from the, from the South Bronx, but I was also a jock, and I was better than anybody else there. I set school records which still stand, which is kind of scary. And what, a long time ago? They should have been gone a long time ago. And, and everybody was really super supportive. I mean, everybody, it was like going to an HBCU except it was all white. Everybody really wanted everybody to succeed because that was the reputation of the place. And you know, it was 95, 96% graduation rate. And, uh, by, it was $3,000 room tuition and fees then. It's now 70,000, I told them, I thought, nobody, it's not, not worth it. But anyway, it's, a, it, it, it's an extraordinary place. And it's transformed to itself so much so that now they're the first African-American president unit in its history. And the place was founded in 1795, so it's not exactly a, yes. yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, but it, it was, a, it was a, again, a, a kind of a microcosm of where I grew up, where it didn't matter what you look like. You know. And what a wise uh, guidance counselor to suggest this place, because I, I didn't know it was such an interesting place. I, it's amazing. Schenectady, New York is slightly above the snowbelt. Mm -hmm. And for a city kid, mm -hmm. Schenectady is smaller than my neighborhood. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> and so it was really strange. And, um, and it was, it was on the downtrend because the General Electric plant closed. The, uh, uh, there was this gigantic locomotive company. They're the ones who created the diesel locomotive. Mm -hmm. And they were doing incredibly well. Everybody was buying these things, and they were wondering why nobody was coming back to get another one. And so they called. Like, this is a story that I like to tell. Mm -hmm. They called around to some of their mm -hmm. customers and said, well, wh why aren't you coming back for maintenance or getting a new engine. These are, they, look, the engine has 250,000 miles on it. It's just being broken in. They built a product that was so good, they actually went out of business. Yeah, so the main employers in Schenectady were gone, and the place was really in decline. It's, it's coming back. Now I was there a few years ago for a reunion. It was, it's coming back. But I realized then that when I was in college, I literally never went downtown in Schenectady. I never set foot downtown. Funny. And it is, it is, but, and so um, is, that's where you decided, what, what did you major in? What? I went in and I majored in uh, biomedical engineering. Because, mm. you know, why not, it was fun. And uh, I guess it was the second semester of my freshman year, I was taking a physics course. Mm -hmm. And I, it was, it was, a, it was a tough course because I was running track at the same time. Mm. And so, I went to the library, and I was going to take an all-nighter, as college kids do, and you know, study for the exam. And everybody knew that if you take this stuff called no-dose, it's a caffeine shot, yeah. it keeps you awake. So I got there at 11 o'clock at night, and I'll never forget this, and I took a couple of no-dose, and the next thing I knew it was 7 o'clock in the morning. I just clunk, <laughs> just went to sleep. <laughs> yes, it was hysterical. I, I still, nowadays, I, I have a, uh, espresso before I go to bed, it doesn't have any effect. Mm -hmm. It was really strange. Mm -hmm. but, but so I went cold into this physics exam yeah. because nobody studies way before, it's kind of ridiculous. And it was fortunately a multiple choice test and I read it and I didn't know much about what was going on. So I would just go pick random numbers, take average of other numbers and you know, fill in all the blanks. And I got an A on the test. Oh my 
So I said, okay, this is providential. So I switched my major to physics. <laughs> and it was a cakewalk yes. after that, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you love physics. Oh, yeah. No, it's fascinating. And it, for me, it wasn't hard. I mean, yeah. if, if, you, if you knew mathematics, yes. the physics stuff was pretty straightforward. And it was um, a lot of fun. And we had spectacular faculty and really, really good laboratories. Mm -hmm. and, and not just in the sciences. My favorite course was a, a course in uh, Russian history. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Board, who was a faculty member, taught that course. And he was actually had a national reputation as a Russian analyst, Soviet analyst then. And the guy named Ennis Pilcher was a physics professor, and he, I did my senior thesis with him, um, and it was just hysterical. We, we had a lot of fun. It was, we had a small Van de Graaff accelerator, and I would be running back and forth with these samples. He said, you're fast, you can run from one room to another. And, and we just, it was a game we played, and ended up doing some interesting stuff, actually. Yeah. And Russian literature. Yeah, I, 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 found, I found Russia to be really an interesting place. Uh, it, it, has, it had and still has extraordinarily cultural energy. Um, the biggest problem it has is the government sucks. It's, it's, like, it's like other countries we just mentioned before. You know, extraordinary cultural energy. The science uh, that comes out of uh, then the Soviet Union and now Russia is simply spectacular. But their government is nuts. And so, but you get a sense when you study Russian civilization and then the Soviet Union, you, f you find the cultural ties to be extraordinary. Um, and there were some pretty interesting people who left there and went to the United States or went to Israel and became sort of the cornerstone of what this place became um, in many ways. And they were very often Russian Jews who were treated badly, even, even you know, it, it, in ways it didn't make any sense. I mean, Nazis did it with, with German Jews. Einstein was one of them. They couldn't get any fired him. They ran just, anyway, and he had the Nobel Prize by then. And they didn't care. So that, the politics got in the way of a lot of things, but the, the, just the study of the Russian culture, um, it, it, it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and you could see the fanaticism in some ways, but the cultural sort of, I would say, energy that they, they produced, it still exists, but it's just suppressed. And, and what happened after your undergraduate degree? Uh, as I mentioned, Schenectady is about the snow belt. Yes. Um, and I decided that I wanted to go a place as far from the snow belt as I possibly could. <laughs> so I, I went to the University of Washington in Seattle, mm. which was a wonderful place. Mm. The year before, in my junior year, I had I worked uh, as a, a summer intern at Brookhaven National Laboratory, and they assigned me to a group from Yale who was doing some things in, in particle physics back in the day when with the, the Bevatron and the, the machines at the Brookhaven, the AGS, were really at the forefront. So I learned a lot from these guys, and the, the guy who was the head of the uh, operation was a guy named Bob Adair, a professor at Yale, and. Uh, his major uh, technician, was more a technician, he was a physicist, named Henry Kasha was Israeli. And over that summer, I actually got a brown belt in, in judo from Henry, because he was a black belt and he was interesting stories. So I got to know those guys very well. So I went to the University of Washington, and Bob Adair called me up after he found out, to, I went to the University of Washington, and said, why, why didn't you apply to Yale? I said, well, you know, I just wanted to get away from the East Coast. I wanted, Get out of the snow belt. He said, well, New Haven's not in the snow belt. You got to come here. So he insisted that I come to Yale after a year at the University of Washington. And I said, all right. I talked to my advisor there uh, at, at the University of Washington. And I was doing theoretical nuclear physics. And he said, you know, if you really want to be big time in particle physics, you got to go to the East Coast. I said, OK. <laughs> That's a blessing. And I went. Um, so I got a master's degree from the University of Washington in physics in a year, and then I okay. went to Yale. And that was a great experience. I, 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 I have never had a bad experience in an educational institution okay. as a student. Okay. Faculty is different, but <laughs> as a student, I found that if you demonstrated you were smarter than everybody else, everybody left you alone. <laughs> you know? And if you, if you screwed up on one thing, they, they made you fix it because they knew that you were smarter than them. And it was, it was easy because these folks really respected 
work ethic, intelligence, and me being a jock. You know, they really, could, there were real, only a few people who did that, they, who were serious about athletics, who were majoring in physics or engineering. Mm -hmm. It just was, they used, they used to, nerds who did nothing but live in the library. Mm -hmm. And that didn't make a lot of sense. So, so that you was. always had track. I, I ran track, yeah, yeah. 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 And I you know, played instruments. I, everybody who did science got stuck on some kind of instruments. I played the clarinet for a long time, and I played the, a, a horn. A, a, it was a, not quite, it was a cornet almost, in a Roman bugle corps, um, single valve trumpet. It was, it was fun. Yeah. And, and so in all these educational institutions, uh, you never felt like you were mistreated or maltreated? No, be, be, for the reasons I said. Okay, but we, my brother and I, learned prejudice in an interesting way. We're growing up in the South Bronx in this perfectly normal neighborhood. My mother's side of the family was really cohesive. My father divorced his family almost entirely, so we never met them in the same context that we met my mother's family. So we said, well, why don't we? We want to meet some of the family. So my brother and I, we were 12. He said, okay, you can go down and spend the summer with my family down in Ahoskie, North Carolina. So he went down there. He's 12 year old kids from the Bronx now. And we get there and these folks are picking cotton and tobacco. They're almost sharecroppers still. And we were doing this and it was, you never want to do it. Picking cotton is nasty and picking tobacco is worse. And Everything sticks to your hands, it's hot, it's just gross. But we went to a movie theater. We'd earn, we're earning whatever we were earning. Uh, and we went to a movie theater, and we went and bought our tickets, and we're going to walk in. And the guy said, no, you can't go in here. This is whites only. You have to go around the corner. It's colored people's entrance. And it was in the balcony. Now, in, in the Bronx, the best seats were always in the balcony. Yeah, because you could throw popcorn yes. down on people <laughs> and stuff like that. But when they made us go to the balcony, it, it, it was not positive, I think it's fair to say. So, didn't cause a ruckus, went, because we were going to sit in the balcony anyway, but to be told you have to sit there was not a good idea. So we came, came back and called my father on one of the few, no, no cell phones, really, all landlines, um, one of the few landlines they had in this town, and said, okay, we would like you to come and pick us up tomorrow. Mm. And he said, well, I'm busy. He said, well, that's okay, we'll take the bus back. We're out of here tomorrow. Mm. And he came down and picked us up. And that really kind of seared some things in, into our psyche. Because it really then mattered what you looked like, not who you were. Mm. And that was really strange. So at that point, I swore I never lived south of Brooklyn. You know, I just, the South was alien to me, and it still is in many ways. D.C. is a southern town. You almost can't go anywhere without bumping into somebody who knows who you are. And that is interesting, but it's also a structurally racist in D.C. And it's, 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 it's surprising that the racism is folks from the first African-American diaspora from the South that, who came up I, just after Reconstruction, and they tended to be the progeny of the slave owners and slaves, so they're lighter skinned. And then there was this, this significant second wave in the 30s and 40s who were primarily farmers and, and sharecroppers and others who were darker skinned. And there's a structure, because if you take a look at who runs DC, it's almost always when it wasn't the white mafia, it was a, the light-skinned African-American mafia, and that's still the case now. The only exception was Marion Barry. But I discovered this, I was told this by some people when I took over UDC, they said you'll never get support because the people who run the city think that the people who would go to UDC, which is the darker-skinned people, are worth charity, but they're not worth support. So they didn't think it an imperative to educate them. It's really, it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic. And that is 
structurally bound. I mean, people say it can't be true. It's absolutely true. It's not even, they don't even hide it anymore. Uh, you know, they, they, they're all sorts of genuflecting towards east of the river. We got to do more in Anacostia. It's just baloney. Uh, the, the only people who do more in Anacostia are the developers who will develop the people who live there out. <laughs> and because that place is beautiful. You go there and you walk up to the some of the hills, you have some spectacular views of the city. Uh, run down, but not so much anymore. And you get people moving in. There's these folks looking around the neighborhood. It's really fascinating. And that's a gentrification they're fighting. But folks will get away with that because there are no support mechanism for the other folks who live in Anacostia. It's really fascinating. DC is a strange Very place. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting place. So the Anacostia are the population that you're describing as the... They're darker skin. The darker if you just walk over there and look, you don't have to... Yeah. Just, just look. There, there, there's some white kids who are moving in there now, which is interesting. I was talking to a guy. I went to the DMV before it became one place. And I went to a... I guess it was McDonald's or something uh, to get some coffee or tea. And I was listening to these two black guys older guy seeing they're battering about. He said, you know, this is ridiculous. It used to be that these white folks were afraid to come here. And now you see these little kids walking around 3 o'clock in the morning with flip-flops walking a dog. He said, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> 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 but that's, that's what you get. It's, it's, it's an interesting place. I find it a, a, a dynamic, which is strange. I, in other places, places like New York, at least it's, the segregation is overt. You, you know what's going on. They redline the neighborhoods and this other kind of stuff. But here, it's, it, it's a little more subtle because people are, black people are doing it to other black people. It's fascinating. Mm. It's fascinating. But, you know. Do you, do you see any efforts to change that? By who? Well, by the, the, the ones that are maybe more powerful? No. No. no if, you, if, if you're in the catbird seat, why would you? Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I just, it's silly. The, Muriel Bowser, who I, I got to know fairly well, tries, mm -hmm. but there's no money in it. You know, the, the, the developers, everybody's pushing for affordable housing, and if you get 20%, you're lucky, mm -hmm. uh, because she can't build anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she can just induce the developers, and she really tries hard to do that. Marion, when he was mayor and coherent for you know, half the time, really pushed hard to get things done, but even he couldn't do it because there's they got to be a payback for these folks. And the developers are not prejudiced. They just, you know, they do it for money. That's what they do. These are, I know some people, really nice people, you know, they don't really have a problem with building it as long as you can pay the rent, you know, <laughs> or buy the condo. If you can't afford it, then it's not in their best interest to, to do it. with um, you know no representation that DC has what, what are your views about that and yes I mean, I mean, <laughs> will that ever change do you think well there's another what's in it for the people it, to change if you take a look at the demographic political demographic in DC the Republicans would be out of their mind to get two Senate seats to the District of Columbia by definition they would be Republican I, I mean Democratic if 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 Eleanor had, who I know very well, I, I actually really like Eleanor. If, if, if she had a vote, mm -hmm. everybody knows what she would do. <laughs> She's, mm -hmm. She is really for yes. helping the city get its act together. But, but I mean, she is also of the view that you can do what you can do. You can't do things you can't right. do. And so you have to rely on the people who can do stuff. And that's what she does. That's why they, she, was, she felt that duty C which is an attitude that many people had, uh, was not going to ever be amount to anything. So they, they passed this law, and she really supported it, called DC TAG, Tuition Assistance Grant, which said if you, anybody graduated from any DC high school, public, private, parochial, didn't make a difference, they would cover the tuition at any public out-of-state university for the kids to go. This is when you, Tuition was reasonable, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, and specifically excluded UDC from that. But they said you can go to any HBCU, public or private, and they would pay that. 
or you could go to one of the other schools in DC, like GW, Georgetown America, and they would have some subsidy for that. But UDC was excluded because, you know, it wasn't worth supporting. Now the DC tag is maybe 10, 12, the people trying to get it to be more, but it's still targeting those schools. DC is still excluded. UDC is still excluded. Uh, Vince Gray did some things to help um, to get more uh, need-based aid to UDC and to Trinity University, which is the other school that really caters to lower-income people. That's, that's their market, actually. You know, they have, that's where they have single mothers from Anacostia. And they, you know, they, they help, yes. But uh, the exclusion is really pretty extraordinary. Uh, but that's just the way it is. Because it, those folks, you guys would just in really hard terms, don't vote, okay? And they don't pay a lot of taxes. And they're, they're not part of the uh, power structure. So there are very few developers. It's, getting, it's changing, but very few developers that come out of there, so. So when you finished at Yale, your PhD, mm -hmm. I went to Brookhaven National Laboratory because we were finishing up experiments. So I worked with Yale for about 10 months. And then I went to Europe, to the European Lab Laboratory for Particle Physics. And I wanted to go. I said, this is something I really want to do because I ran track and I got to know a bit of the world. And so I said, well, you know, I'll go and live in Geneva for a couple of years. So I said, okay. I wrote to CERN and they said, sure, you know, We'll accept you got to bring your own money. So I wrote to the Ford Foundation and I said, I want to go to CERN, you should give me money, basically. And Bob Adair, who's this wonderful guy, said, yeah, it'll never work. Four days later, they called me and said, how much money do you need? <laughs> <laughs> it was fabulous. Yeah. So, so but when I got to CERN, I told them how much money the Ford Foundation had given me. And they said, you can't live here on that. They doubled it and paid me in Swiss francs. Mm. I mean, it, 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 I, I, I could count the number of black people at CERN on one hand, OK? <laughs> and they were just totally welcoming. It didn't, they didn't even blink. It was just like, OK, here's this smart guy. He may look funny, but no. He's here. He went to Yale. He must be all right. And that was it. I got a job, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, was, it was interesting. These people were really nice, very international. The team was Dutch, British, Swiss, French, a couple of Americans. I was probably mostly the only American there, but there were a few others. And it was, it was just a kind of environment that was, it was a small group, familial, everybody knew everybody else, and it kind of worked. Yeah. And then you came back to the States? After a time, you have to not be a postdoc, you have to become a faculty member, so yes. as you know. Yes. So I got invited back to a bunch of places to, to give a talk um, to see if I'd be interested in working there. They, they were recruiting me, which is really kind of nice. So I went to Caltech, and I met Dick Feynman. I had lunch with him, a delightful guy. I gave a talk at Caltech, the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, at the Stanford Lunar Accelerator, which is where I got to know Bert Richter, because he was a deputy director. No, he wasn't. He was, he was an experimenter who became the director of Slack. Uh, I can't remember when he became, but he was, he was this really nice guy. And we were, after that, we were really friends for a couple of decades, actually. Um, and I, is it Penn, Penn, Caltech, Stanford, Harvard, and one other place, I can't remember. And I got offers from all these places. And, I took Harvard, and Bert Richter looked at me and said, you must be crazy. Why are you going to that place? <laughs> you know, you could, you could be a real physicist and stay here. <laughs> uh, and I said, oh, I'll go to Harvard, because what the heck, I mean, you know. And it was, that was, again, was the same kind of environment. Um, first of all, there were hardly any black PhDs in physics. There were, you were the only one? There may have been three or four. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. that, and I was the only one who survived Yale. And I, I got out in three years. I mean, it was really kind of nice. And they actually wanted me to succeed. I mean, they, what, that's what they, they wanted to have happen. And what's interesting is that I, I, I probably wouldn't have done as well if I wasn't black, because they never 
questioned me. You know, I never got challenged because I knew what I was doing. They, they, they knew that I knew what I was doing, and they said, look, if, if he was a white kid, he might have slipped by. This black guy had to work for everything he got. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all, no problem. Just let, <laughs> let him do it. And I did, and I had a good time at Harvard. Um, I, I, I guess you know, I had a good time everywhere because I didn't run into stupid people um, who had prejudices, who, who were thinking they were better than me, because I couldn't have been there if, if I hadn't been better than them, right? So they sort of assumed it. Yeah, and they didn't find it a threat. They found me an asset because I could help them out and make them look good, and that's, that's the game. It was, it was interesting. It's, it's, been, it's been a thread throughout, I think, things I've done, but it all went back to the confidence I got from my parents and the fact that if you didn't do it better than anybody else, you were, to put it gently, screwed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that came also from your parents. Yes, it, it was. It was just ind indistinguishable from eating and breathing. Mm -hmm. You, you not only have to be successful, you have to be better than everybody else, because where they came from in the South, it almost didn't have matter how good you were. You weren't going to make it. You weren't going to make it. They wouldn't let you. The system would not let you. And everybody knew who they were. And you were at Harvard for. Uh, I've been in Harvard twice. I was in the faculty there for probably five years, six years. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, I got an Alpha B. Sloan Foundation Fellowship. Mm -hmm. So that was nice. It was free money. You can do whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. And Derek Bach was the president there. And Derek, mm -hmm. another fabulous human being. I mean, I just hard to, I know a lot of nice people. Derek was amazing. So uh, I got this Ford Foundation, I mean, this Al Sloan Foundation Fellowship. And I said, OK, well, what am I going to do with this? And they basically, he said, you can do whatever you want. So I managed to put together an experiment that was trying to develop a new kind of detector, particle physics detector. And I did it with a, an engineer from the University of Illinois, one from Harvard, an undergraduate who was about to drop out named Andy Strominger, who turns out to be a university professor at Harvard and is an extraordinary string theorist. But he was this, this young guy who didn't quite know what he was doing. His father was a super famous chemist at Harvard, who, whose laboratory incubated about five or six Nobel Prize winners. So everybody thought this guy was walking in water, and, and, and Andy was a little alienated. So he and I, with these other folks, put this experiment together at, at Fermilab. And what was amazing to everybody, and we spent half a million dollars on this thing, um, was that it worked. <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing experiment, and it, it, we were struggling with it because nobody had done this before, and it was cryogenic, so it was really low temperature stuff, and it wasn't working, and the, the, the engineer from Harvard really was kind of getting depressed, oh, the electronics were never going to work. So I was there in the night shift one time by myself, and it was freezing at Fermilab, as usual, in the middle of the the Illinois desert, which was just like the prairie. We introduced bison there. I mean, it just, oh, it was really a pretty interesting place. And I was fiddling with this, this, tech, this these circuits because it wasn't working, and all of a sudden the thing just boom came to life at four o'clock in the morning. And I said, This is the best feeling I've ever had because I was the only one in the world who knew that that experiment worked at that point. I was the only one. It was amazing because I was there by myself. And it was, it was a spectacular success. And when we presented it at CERN, Sam Ting had done uh, interesting experiments in this space. And there were some other physicists who did interesting experiments. And we showed how to get their results and our result. And theirs were not correct, and ours was the right one. So we could, we, could, we could manipulate things and show how you could make a mistake and how to get it right. And it turned out that this, this experiment was considered one of the top experiments, results, experimental results in, uh, in particle physics instrumentation in the decade of the 70s. It was really kind of neat. Yeah, so it's in a book, and I got a copy of it. You know, it, just, it was breakthrough kind of stuff. But there was a lot of help from my friends there. You know, they, they knew if it worked, everybody looks good. And it worked. And only this crazy guy who thought he could make things work <laughs> was allowed to do this kind of stuff. 
And Bob Adair looked at me and said, you know, the most amazing thing is that y it works. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> I thought it was pretty amazing myself. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. And after that? When Jimmy Carter was present, a few people, he, he thought nuclear weapons proliferation was the worst thing that could ever happen anyway. Mm -hmm. So he, he had a few people from Harvard and other places come down to Washington to work on this issue. And I went down and worked in what was then, on sabbatical, the uh, Armed Control and Disarmament Agency, which is now totally absorbed into the State Department. Mm -hmm. And I spent probably a year there, then I went back to Harvard and I was asked to go back to the State Department, but you can't really get two years sabbatical. They didn't even give it to Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and and uh, Derek said, okay, go ahead. So I was able to maintain my appointment with a second year of sabbatical, which is extraordinary. And then I got invited to stay permanently at the State Department by uh, a guy who was a dear friend. And I said, okay, you know, what the heck? You know, go, you go from Harvard to the State Department, even though they don't pay you well, in the government, they paid me twice as much as I was getting paid at Harvard. <laughs> so it was a no-brainer <laughs> in some real sense. What aspect of the state department? Well, it was, it was in the arms control. And then I went into the, the oceans, environment, and uh, oh, science yes. area. Yeah. Tom Pickering was the assistant secretary. Yeah. And he's the one who induced me to come and stay in the state department. And these, you know, these, these guys are just extraordinary people. I, I, I got lucky. But I did have fun, run into some significant prejudice in the state department just because there were hardly any blacks there, and they, they still aren't. And I remember once I was chairing a meeting, and there were all these folks standing around, and I walked into the meeting and everybody got quiet. And I just sort of looked and said, you know, okay, so I told them who I was and started the meeting. And they were just looking around, not knowing what the heck they made. It was people from the Defense Department and um, State Department, some people from the CIA, you know, was dealing with nuclear weapons. Uh, in a part of the world that I got stuck with, you know, just, and after the meeting, and I was chairing this meeting, after meeting I had another meeting to go to, I think it, it might have been at the, the CIA or some other place, so they have cars in the State Department to take you around, and there was a guy who was, I think, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense at the time named Paul Wolfowitz. Mm -hmm. He was in the meeting, so we both go down, to the basement of the State Department, waiting for cars to take us somewhere. And he looked at me and said, oh, oh, okay, you can bring my car over here. And, you know, I'll, and I looked at him and said, uh, I know you don't remember who I am. That's not my problem, but this car is my car. I'm sure yours is gonna show up. And I left him standing in the basement. And, and I wonder, what the, this guy was in the meeting for two hours with me. And I guess all black people look the same. And I just couldn't believe it. I just, and this is a guy who went on to run the World Bank. Yeah, I just don't, it's very smart, but deficient in some ways. Um, another thing I ran into, the, there was a guy named Richard Kennedy who was one of these guys who is, he was a, a commissioner of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And he was not a technologist, but a really, really smart guy and very committed to the nonproliferation theme. And he became uh, ambassador at large for nonproliferation. And I was working with him because I was in the OES Bureau at State and I was the nuclear guy. And he and I led a delegation to negotiate with the Soviets again, and it was in Brussels. And then we, we talked, after that, we talked to the folks at the European Union because there was a, a US, Europe, nuclear cooperation agreement and we had to negotiate to find deals to details of that. So there was a reception at the uh, U.S. ambassador's house, U.S. ambassador to the European Union then. So I'm walking in with Dick Kennedy. I, I, I'm the only black guy there. And, and Dick Kennedy is a big, hulking white guy, you know, just really serious kind of Irish, mm -hmm. fun, just a nice, nice guy. So I'm walking in and the guy says he knew Dick Kennedy, he said, hi Dick, blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and said, oh, you can wait outside. And Kennedy looked at this guy and said, he's my deputy delegation leader. And this guy went ashen. I didn't say anything, I just walked by. And that told me something about the State Department. 
and it's still true today. And I bumped into this guy, who was a serious, serious ambassador, um, a couple of times in the cafeteria in the State Department, and every time he tried to come up and apologize, I just walked away. So he can, as far as I was concerned, you know, you can, you can take it with you. I don't need it. But that kind of stuff is structural in the environment in which we're embedded. Um, but you, if you let it bother you, it'll kill you. Right? So I just get back, pay back. You know, I remember Jesse Jackson telling me a story once. He's, he's another interesting character. Uh, he was running for president. And I think he had a reception fundraiser at the Washington Hilton, I think it was. And you know, there were a lot of things going on at the Washington Hilton. So after he had gave his talk and blah, 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 he was leaving, going to another event. And there was a woman who pulled up. He was standing outside, okay? and it was raining a little bit. And she didn't want to get wet, so she pulled up to where he was, handed him the key to her car, and said, would you please just park this for me? And he looked at this lady and said, sure. He kept her keys. His car came, limousine came, he went off, and he said, I have no idea how that lady got home that night. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, people, I mean, he was the most visible black man in America. And this woman, this person, just said, another black guy. And, ha and he, she assumed he was a chauffeur and handed, I couldn't believe it. I just, <laughs> so it wasn't just me. So I thought, OK. <laughs> it's just strange. This is a strange place. But if, if you internalize it, it kills you. So I just, I learned not to care for my parents, and I haven't cared. And that's probably the strength that, that my father never cared either. He, was, he went through some stuff in the Navy, which was ex simply extraordinary. I mean, he was in the Pacific. He was a gunner's mate on the destroyer. Kamikaze pilots would fly into the gun and blow him overboard. I mean, he, he did all sorts of stuff, and the, Officers were treating him like shit, and that didn't work out too well for him. I mean, he remembered he threw one officer overboard and grabbed the shell. He was going to throw the shell on top of the guy, and he was stopped because that would have been murder. But you know, he he got court martialed for insubordination, got off. But he must have been court martialed half a dozen times, just because the structural racism was absurd. They didn't recognize that these guys, just because they were black, were probably better fighters than they were because they had to fight all the time. You know, when coming up, they had to, they had to recognize when he was a, almost a teenager that, that he couldn't live in that place and he, his family were just not the kind of people he wanted to be around because they, they, they allowed themselves to be subjugated. And so he left, and that took some courage, uh, um, with, especially without a job, you know. <laughs> but he just left. And he had a, a high school diploma and he knew stuff, but he wasn't educated beyond that. It didn't bother him except when it began to limit him a little bit. And that's, that's probably the dynamic where he insisted that you kids, kids, I don't care what else you do, you're gonna learn something. And he also told us to learn to train. So I was, I was doing physics, but I also could build a barn. I could fix my own car when it was possible to fix the car. Now you just plug it in the computer and tell you what's wrong. But I, when I went to Yale, I, I always wanted to buy a, uh, have a Jaguar. So um, I got this car, which was not exactly in the best of shape, and I had it in New Haven in the parking lot uh, in front of the Gibbs Science Building, and I rebuilt the engine <laughs> it, over the summer, uh, just, you know, to get the parts here and there from a, yeah, it was XAE, it was a beautiful car. Oh my goodness. It had major problems though, because it, it had these uh, wire wheels, and there were 24 spokes in each wheel, and you had to tune them every morning, and the car would run like a rock. <laughs> so I gave that one up. I said, no, nah, I think I can do better. But I fixed it. I made the car work, and I, I, paid, I got twice as much for it as I paid. So it was just fun. But you, you, we learned the practical stuff, and we learned the more esoteric stuff, because in the end, you could always make a living, because they can't take away what you know. Well, <laughs> if it's okay, I don't know. It's always okay. I, I, I find it amusing. So my, my brother, as I said, was somewhat lazy and a little pig-headed, because if he wasn't pig-headed, he wouldn't have been lazy. And my father, he, we graduated 
from high school. We were having graduation parties all over the city. And my brother and I went to the graduation party in Red Hook in Brooklyn. And I said, okay, it was 11 o'clock. I said, we have to go, go and get back home. Because my father said, you have to go home by midnight. And he really meant it. I mean, he, he, ran the, he ran the roost. So my brother said, no, no, I'm going to stay a little longer. I said, you really want to do that? I said, you know we have to be home by midnight. He said, oh, I'm not worried about it. So I go, and I got home by midnight, and he wasn't there. And we had an apartment. It's, it was a really interesting New York City apartment. There were five of us in this apartment. Um, you could call it two bedrooms, if you're generous. <laughs> and uh, the, the bathroom with a tub was right near the front door. So my father was waiting for my brother to come in the bathtub, having a nice warm bath. And my brother came in, I don't know, it must have been 12, 30, a quarter to one. And my father leapt out of the bathtub with no clothes on. And my sister alerted my brother that he had a problem. And my father chased him literally down the stairs. We were in the fourth floor walk-up. And when my father got out to the street, a woman saw him and screamed, and then he realized he was naked. He had no clothes on. <laughs> so he went back upstairs, and my brother didn't quite know what to do because he knew he wasn't going to get back in the apartment. And we had these wonderful neighbors, so he went and stayed with a neighbor downstairs, and the next day he enlisted in the Air Force. Mm. Next day. He was, it, he's lucky he had a high school diploma. So he, he enlisted in the Air Force, uh, had several tours in Vietnam because he liked it. He was a guy who wanted to be a cop, right? So he liked that sort of stuff. And he was civil air patrol, so he got to fly around, he did search and rescue and all this other kind of stuff. But he, he was having a good time, which speaks to his personality somewhat. Um, he's very gregarious, I think that's fair to say. Um, he doesn't have a shy bone in his body. And he educated himself, because he realized he had to, because you're not going to make it on uh, what you get in the military. So he used the, the opportunities available to himself. He got a bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland University College. He got a master's degree in uh, history and sociology. He actually taught high school sociology. Um, that didn't work out too well because he didn't take stuff from kids. And some kids were mouthing off. So yeah, that didn't work. So he started his own company. And he, he moved to Florida and married a, a beautiful German woman. They moved to Florida. And he found pressures there, because these guys coming back from Vietnam, and these idiots in Florida were trying to call him out for all sorts of interesting ways. So he didn't like that. So he started a security company. And he's been doing that for, oh, it wants to be 20 years. So he set up, set up, and he's been doing it for banks and so on. And the biggest thing he found was, the difficulty was hiring reliable people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But he's still living in, in Florida. Sister? My sister graduated from Yale, mm -hmm. went in the Army. MD. Yep. Yeah. And then she was head of, she, has a, she had an MD and a Master's of Public Health, both from Yale. Mm -hmm. And she was head of emergency medicine in Northern Virginia when 9 11 happened. Mm -hmm. And she said, Well, you know, I, that's interesting. She hadn't slept for four days. She said, I will never do this again. She pulled up, she moved to around Tacoma, Washington, or, or Corvallis, Oregon, I can't remember. She bought a ranch, and she'd been there ever since. She had her own private practice. She's still practicing medicine, and uh, doing pretty well. She, I, she had an a, a interesting business in the rehabilitation of medicine. She had a, a series of clinics in um, Connecticut, for wealthy people who had drug addictions or alcohol addictions. Mm -hmm. And she did well, but then she sold the business because she didn't need to do much better. <laughs> okay, she, she did fine. She did really yeah, yeah. Um, do we have, how much time do we have? About uh, 15 minutes. Oh, good. Um, you know, you touched on race a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you have throughout, but in, in terms of Washington, D.C. Um, I just wondered if you would say a little bit about currently where this country is and what your views are about that. I, I will say 
something that is still surprises me. I think Donald Trump did everybody a favor. He showed such extraordinary bigotry and malfeasance that it let the crazies out of the box. So the country could no longer deny that there are these crazies out there. And one of the things they've discovered, they should have discovered, they should have really begun to analyze it, is that craziness in this sense has become a part of the mainstream in this country. The racism is structural. This crazy stuff about let's not teach critical race theory. Well, if, if, you, if you teach the Constitution of the United States, you're teaching critical race theory, folks. <laughs> so just read it. You don't know. You, have you read it? So what we have now is a. Could you explain that? I, I think we need to have that recorded. If you read if the you Constitution, read the it, 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 it was a balance between crazies and more crazies, where they defined um, people in categories. If you're a white male landholder, you, you got to vote. The women didn't have the vote. And uh, because African Americans were the majority population, and the landowners wanted to make sure that they got their bases covered. Black people had with three fifths, three fifths of a person, for the point for the purpose of, of, of the census, but they couldn't vote, of course, um, and that is structural in the United States, and it didn't disappear for a long time. <laughs> when I say long time, it was a couple hundred years, um, and people were. I mean, I grew up when they were marching to get the vote for black people. And I, like, why not? I mean, they're paying taxes. What's your problem? Because they, the, the folks who were in charge were afraid that they'd be outnumbered in many ways. Okay? That is a, the, the nature of this beast that we have. And a friend of mine feels very strongly that the real reason behind this fear of, of black people in, in mostly the, the white environment, but not only, is it's sexual. They're afraid that these black men and women are going to seduce the white men and women and it'll dilute the race and everybody will become black after a while. So there won't be any future for white people, pure white people in this place. It's completely nuts. I just, I, I, you know, it's, it's embarrassing, but that is structural. And the, the, what Trump did was let the crazies say it in public. And they said it and people said, you got to be kidding me. Although. If you go to any college, uh, you, I couldn't do this, but you go to any college and you say, room full of white kids, and you say, you talk about how people are treated in the United States, you ask them to raise their hand if they would rather be black. Nobody's going to raise their hand. That means they know it. They know there's a problem here, right? They know there's a structural impediment, but it was always hush hush, except maybe in Alabama, you know, Mississippi, which is not even a place to me, but nobody talked about it. Well, they're talking about it now. Right? And, and Trump helped people see these assholes out there, but what bothered me more was that the assholes thought it was a good idea to be seen. And they came out and they, they showed them. And, and when you, you got people murdered in Minneapolis, you know, it just, and it's more than one person, okay? The, or or, or in, in Nashville, or in other places, and they thought they could get away with this? They probably could have 10 years ago. Yeah. Trump made it impossible. Because if you got white folks on the jury and they can't see what's going on, then they can't see anything. Okay? I would think that before Trump, it wouldn't have been as easy to get somebody really purged, sent life in prison that they did in Georgia, for this, this yeah. shooting this guy. I mean, yeah. they, were, they were absolutely stunned these three people, I mean, first degree murder. I, what? Are you kidding me? Even their lawyers were stuck. Yes, yes. And, and the judge said, you know, this is not even open and shut. This is just shut, shut. <laughs> but that wouldn't have happened because people, I think, of goodwill are just scandalized. Mm. They just can't, under, they can't believe that they've been living with this their entire life and never notice it. And now you got these crazy people in Florida, well, not crazy, but mm -hmm. the, the, the governor, for example, or this, this person who pretends to be governor in, in South Dakota saying you can't
teach this, or we, then read the Constitution. If you read the Constitution, you realize this country was founded on a structural bias, and it's endemic, and it's not changed. It's, it's just look around the corner. And, and then you have people who think it's, well, maybe God wanted it this way. What the hell are you talking about? I mean, the, the last time no, somebody... Spokespersons for God. Yeah, I, the last time I'm aware that it was documented, and I don't believe that either, was the Ten Commandments. <laughs> that was the last time. So, so you, had, you had George W. Bush speaking to God, and Osama bin Laden speaking to God. Well, you know, they, they got different answers, folks. Right? So this, this religion stuff is complete nonsense. But people use it as a, as a cloak behind which to hide. Uh, these folks on the, on the Supreme Court, especially the latest one, it's just, you know, the, the, bad, the worst thing that we have not done is, is to purge ourselves of religion in some ways. You know, it's, everybody should have faith in something. Everybody can believe whatever they want. But when it's organized religion, it becomes a business. And the biggest business in the United States is religion. The second business, biggest business is education. But number one is religion. And these, these folks are just milking people because fo people need to believe in something, okay? And the faith is a wonderful thing. And belief is, is necessary because if you didn't believe in something, you'd probably shoot yourself, right? So those are, those are characteristics that are probably necessary for humans to, to survive in a society. But religion's a problem because as soon as it becomes organized, it becomes a business. experiences with racism and all that, and I, I'm wondering, given this climate now in this country, any advice for the younger generation of African Americans? I think the younger generation of African Americans don't really need advice, it's the white folks that need advice. What's the advice for the white folks? Look, through, look in a mirror. Okay, mm -hmm. if you don't like what somebody's doing, walk in their shoes. Just trade places with them for a little while. Raise your hand and say, I want to be black for one day or 10 minutes. Just try it. Then you'll understand. I have a very good friend in the UK who married an Egyptian. He's a senior person in the Tory party. He's a, he's a, a hereditary peer. And he told me, you know, I never understood that we had prejudice in the UK until he married an Egyptian. He said, I, I can't believe it. Because he never and experienced it. Is just exactly he so never experienced it. Yes. Full of prejudice. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the same at least. And we learn from them, you know. So, so, but I think that the the problem, I mean, we we need not be extreme. Black folks need not be extreme, but they need to just look at folks and understand that they don't understand because they never experienced it, and say, okay, here's my shoe, walk in it. You know, be be generous. Be helpful. And you don't have to be nasty and obnoxious because these folks aren't stupid. They, they really are not venal. I, I don't think they're evil. I think they just don't know. And they can't imagine, or they're not allowed to imagine, or they're trained not to imagine. And, and so we can help them imagine because you're not going to change by yelling at them. They're not going to change. But if you help them see, I think that's the best we can do. It's a place, this, this, one of the, the things about this country that I think is, is very positive is people of goodwill are prepared to see, okay? So black folks have got to be able to see the white folks too. And you raise your hand, you want to be white, but all the, the social trends and, the, and the, the cultural norms are being developed by the, in the African-American milieu. I mean, the, the rappers, the, the designer of clothes, I mean, they're just, they're hardly white folks, okay? So they do appreciate that, that, that kind of cultural energy that the African-American experience has developed in, in, in many people. But they don't see it in themselves. So if, if you help them see, and I think, you know, I've got very many white friends who are in biracial marriages, as am I, and they don't understand until they have kids what it is. They just said, I never learned that in school. Exactly. So you have to experience it. And that's, we learn by doing, we're humans. And I think we have to give them that space and that help. Thank you. Thank you 
Thank you so much. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> I even got a glass of water out of it. <laughs> Fantastic. What a story. Well, life has been interesting and good. They got it because they experienced the other side. Yeah. But I think, you know, when you mentioned the, 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 the children who are biracial, mm -hmm. I think that's, a, that's kind of a nice trend. I think that's a, it's a civilizing trend. It's a very civilizing yeah, trend. Yeah, it is. Because then you, you see yourself in these kids. Steve Trachtenberg told me, he, Steve is this wonderful guy who thinks he's black. I mean, he's wonderful. <laughs> um, and he and I commune often. And he would go on these trips uh, with some of these uh, high rollers. You know, th th you raise money, you got to do it together. And he said these, these folks would never understand or have a conversation about these issues of race until one of them mentions that, oh, you know, I've got a black grandkid because, you know, my son married this uh, black girl. And all of a sudden, it changed because then the guy over there said, well, you know, my daughter said she was gay. And it just changed. As soon as they knew it was okay to talk about it, <laughs> boom. Yeah. So, and that, that's, you have to help them see that. 